Welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many people. We've got lots of, uh, uh, of uh, familiar faces, uh, members of the society, and we also have many uh, guests here today. You're all very, very welcome indeed. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to uh, organize this event and, and welcome people from all over the world. We have participants in uh, California at one extreme and uh, Australia and New Zealand at the other end. Uh, it's one of the advantages of Zoom, isn't it, that you can bring in so many more people than you otherwise uh, could um, uh, for a physical meeting. Uh, before we uh, hear from Professor Tuck, uh, just uh, allow me to say one or two words about um, the Herculaneum Society, which is sponsoring this event. My name is Bob Fowler, and I'm the chair of the trustees of the society, which was founded in 2004 to promote research and education and uh, public awareness of uh, the World Heritage Site of Herculaneum, which is a fantastic place. And by your presence here, you've, you, you've uh, acknowledged that in a sense and your interest in it. And I'm sure that almost everybody has been there, but if you haven't been there, it's uh, a fantastic place to visit. Uh, and in many ways, uh, more rewarding an experience than Pompeii which of course is fantastic too, but we're all very much devoted to Herculaneum. And since uh, it's in some senses, the poor sister, we uh, like to promote its interests. Uh, it has so much to offer. Uh, we um, host many events like this, and we also raise funds to support education and research at Herculaneum. Uh, we've given out many grants and scholarships over the years. Uh, we organize visits to archaeological sites uh, here uh, in, in Britain um, and elsewhere. And then, of course, also we organize uh, visits to Herculaneum and to uh, Campania. Uh, the last one was meant to happen uh, in uh, 2020. Um, and like everything else, it fell victim to the uh, pandemic. But we will certainly be going there again. Um, if you're new to the society, again, very warm welcome, and I would encourage you strongly to find out more about us. Um, our website is very easy to find. Um, I'll just bring that up now. And um, if it's uh, herculaneum.ox ox.ac.uk. If you Google the Herculaneum Society, you'll find it right away. And you can find out information about what we do here and how to support us, how to join or how to make a donation. And if you scroll down the screen, you can see our announcements and our events. You can also uh, subscribe to our e-news bulletin, which comes out once a month and is very informative and, and chatty and very popular. Uh, so those are, you can do that without being a member. So those are all possibilities, and we hope that uh, uh, you might consider uh, joining us. Okay. Now, um, on to the, uh, the main event. Uh, very pleased to have with us today Professor Stephen Tuck, uh, who did his PhD at the University of Michigan uh, and uh, is now the Professor of uh, History and Classics at Miami University in Ohio. He's a specialist in Roman art and archaeology, uh, particularly in uh, Campania, uh, focusing on Pompeii. Uh, we do give the other place a look in from time to time here in this society, you know, uh, because the two uh, do have so much in common and much of what you uh, say about uh, Pompeii has implications for Herculaneum. Uh, and much of the research that one would wish to do at Pompeii uh, inevitably takes you to Herculaneum because a lot of the uh, evidence that you want to, to uh, explore is, is there as well. Uh, but Steve has concentrated uh, uh, particularly on, on Pompeii. Uh, he's uh, an expert not only in art, but also in Roman uh, epigraphy. Uh, he's interested in the whole area, the whole subject of Roman spectacles. Uh, and he's uh, worked also on the subject of imperial government, particularly in the period of uh, the um, first and second centuries AD and uh, on natural disasters in the Roman world. Of course, the head of that list is the eruption of, uh, of Vesuvius. Um, he's uh, written a history of Roman art, which is published by Wiley Blackwell. And um, the uh, second edition of that 
I understand is just about to come out in paperback next month. Is that right, Steve? Um, so my spies informed me. I have not actually seen it myself, but that's okay. what I've been told to. <laughs> well, well, there it is. Highly recommended. Um, glad, glad to give this puff, take this opportunity to give, give uh, th this book a, a little Thanks boost there. Uh, yeah, and uh, that, uh, as I say, the paperback second edition will be out uh, next month, so look that out. Um, Steve is also a gifted teacher. He um, has done much work um, outside the university classroom and uh, won many awards. In particular, he's won the Archaeological Institute of America's um, award for excellence in undergraduate teaching. Now that is a national award in the United States. It's a tremendously prestigious uh, award and, and uh, uh, tremendous congratulations due to, to Steve for that uh, signal honor. So we're very privileged and delighted to have uh, Professor Tuck with us here today uh, to speak on the subject of can we find survivors from the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79? Over to you, Steve. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, all of you being here. My understanding is that um, is that the, your attendance is supporting um, scholarships um, for the Herculaneum Society, which I just think is a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful um, um, opportunity to um, to support the society in that way. I am going to go ahead and share my screen so you can look at something besides me, and um, we'll see how this goes. If Bob, if you could nod that you can actually see that or make yep. some more, ah, excellent. Okay, let's carry on. So um, as um, thank you for the introduction. And as stated, this is what we're gonna do is take a look at, um, at my search for survivors um, from the eruption of Vesuvius, uh, which this picture has really nothing to do with the 79 eruption, but I just like it and it's my talk. So there we go. Uh, let you know what you're in for here. Um, so this study um, had a couple of major goals and one secondary one. Um, first, whether we could say for certain, for certain, whether any inhabitants um, survived the eruption. If so, can we say where they went and um, where they resettled? And then finally, um, what is the role of government in all of this? And that to me is actually an interesting question. Um, and that, um, well, it, it raises the, the, the question of uh, disaster response in the ancient world. And uh, what level of government, at what point do they step in? The, um, the evidence for whether anyone got out is, um, is mixed. Um, on the one hand, we have um, we do have bodies. There's no there's no denying the skeletons at Herculaneum, the, the body casts, of course, at Pompeii. Um, altogether, um, we have a number of bodies. Perhaps if I did the math right, which I almost certainly did not, um, about 2,000 um, human remains have been found between the two communities, um, suggesting at least a, a large number of people did not get out. Um, However, disaster narratives in the ancient world almost never mention survivors. Um, I think uh, Jerry Toner um, calculated that 8% of Roman disaster narratives actually mention survivors. And so in that way, for example, uh, Seneca's comments on the earthquake of 62 or 63, if you prefer, um, is unusual in that it does mention relocation of people, but that does suggest that people left after that earthquake and that they, they did relocate. And that's an interesting and important um, source amongst the silence. Um, by the way, this image down at the bottom, yeah, I know it's a little flip, but um, I um, uh, this is a t-shirt you can buy online. I have three of them. Um, just. Thought I'd point that out. I don't get any money for it, but a um, modern scholarly opinion on whether anyone survived from Pompeii or Herculaneum is mixed. Some scholars, eminent authorities like Joe Barry, for example, think that um, a lot of people got out. She says the majority. Uh, Robert says it seems probable, though, that a significant number, perhaps the majority, hedge, hedge, hedge. Uh, um, and then we have the other side or Pellegrino's book, um, which is just 
florid prose. I love this. Outside the city gates, under present day homes, vineyards, and garbage dumps, more than 10,000 human skeletons are now known to lie within the earth's fossil record. Well, this is just, I wish I could write like this. This is wonderful. It's also um, complete nonsense. Um, um, we don't know of 10,000 human skeletons outside the walls, and they are certainly not in the fossil record, no matter, I suppose that's just hyperbole. Oh, but my favorite part, cut down by the volcanic death cloud. Oh, great stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, no matter what side people come down on, whether for or against or somewhere in the middle about issues of survivors, none of these authorities cite any evidence. Where is the evidence that people did or did not get away? Particularly if they're saying that people survived, um, the question has always been an open one. Um, how do we know? How can we prove it? So I came up with a process to do just that. I came up with a list of seven categories of evidence that I thought would demonstrate one way or another that people got out. Um, and so this is, my, uh, this is my process and then we'll go into what I've discovered. Um, actual individuals cited in inscriptions, both in what I call the source cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum and refuge cities. Can I find names of individuals who we know of at one of these communities and somewhere else later on. That's the gold standard, category one of evidence. Category two is changes in the onomastic profile of a community. That is, can I find Pompeian or Herculanean names um, you know, appearing somewhere where they had not previously been? Okay, And this is a challenge because a lot of family names in the Roman world are very widespread. And so in fact, for example, I give the example here of the Granii, are found at Pompeii and Puteoli. John Darms referred to them as the most prominent family in late Republican Puteoli. This is a real issue in terms of finding survivors because other people with the same last name somewhere um, means that the onomastic profile of the community, that is the last names, uh, doesn't change. And this means that what are probably or likely um, the largest group of um, survivors, that is people who made it out and then moved in with family um, are invisible. So for example, if my town is hit by an earthquake now and I moved into my father's basement, um, not outside the realm of possibility, it would not change the onomastic profile of his community. His last name is the same as mine. And um, I, I, I wouldn't be discoverable there. So if people move where they already had family, um, I cannot find them um, through um, looking at changes in the net last names in a community. Um, appearance of, of voting tribes. Different communities have different voting tribes in the Roman world. That's another source of evidence that might um, help um, give a sense that people had moved from one of the um, origin communities to, um, to, as I refer to them, a refuge community. Um, explicit indications of origins. If somebody says, I was a resident at Pompeii or I was born at Herculaneum, um, that would be ideal, obviously. Um, now, there's huge limitations in this uh, methodology. Uh, as I said, in number three, I can't find people that move in with you know, direct family members. Um, I also cannot find non-Romans. That is, for example, we think that there was a, a Jewish community down in the Bay of Naples. I'm certain of it. I'm certain there was. Um, but without family names, I cannot trace individuals. Um, um, Joshua Ben Joseph is Joshua Ben Joseph, and there's a lot of them. So it's really difficult um, to figure out how to find um, people in those ways. So these are my four main categories of evidence for um, survivors or refugees. Um, I, I use the terms interchangeably. And then I came up with three categories of supporting evidence. And I gave myself the task of not, um, of only declaring that I had certainly found survivors if I have 
more than one category of this evidence in a community for an individual. Intermarriage between refugee or survivor families um, for whom there is no evidence that those families were connected um, otherwise. Um, material culture, um, the worship of, of Vulcan or, or Venus Pompeiana um, in a new community. Um, and then finally, um, new infrastructure consistent with larger populations. Um, and this bleeds into my last um, of my three big themes and that is um, government intervention. Okay, can we see government response in this as well? So what do we have? All right, I've, I've set up this, um, this process. I've got my seven categories of evidence. Oh, it all looks very, um, very professional. Um, oh, sorry, I had an eighth one, um, which turned out to be totally useless. I, I almost deleted this, but I left it on here to show you the limitations again. Um, isotope analysis indicates shifting populations. I like this. Um, you may recognize this um, um, uh, image here of a skeleton from, um, from the cemetery outside the walls of the city of York in, um, in um, Northern England. Um, and that is somebody who was executed in the amphitheater at York. There's their head down there and you can see the shackles around their feet. Um, isotope analysis indicates that this person was from the Eastern Mediterranean and then um, executed in the amphitheater at York. Um, and that sort of, um, of um, evidence which would indicate um, somebody having moved at the appropriate time. Having created um, my categories of evidence that I would accept, I then went through and created databases of family names for all of these communities, Pompeii and Herculaneum to start with. And then I started to look around for other possible communities where they might have settled. And I selected Capua, Cumi, Baiae, Mycenaeum, Naples, Nola, Ostia, Pestum, Puteoli, Salerno, Sorrentum, Ulibrae, and Velia as possible um, refuge cities. And I compiled databases of the nomina of all the inhabitants there. And then I started to look for patterns. As it might be obvious to you at this point, I don't have cable TV. So this filled my, my time. It turned out, oh, sorry, looking at that list that almost all of these um, were a complete waste of time. Well, finding out nothing is finding out something. Um, almost all of these were, um, were failures. Um, almost all of them um, had no positive evidence for um, resettlement of survivors from Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, some of them were suggestive. I found one um, skeleton in, at Isola Sacra in Ostia, for example, which uh, the isotope analysis suggests that the person left um, coastal Campania at about AD 80 and died in, um, in Ostia about 20 years later. So really suggestive, um, but I don't have a name to go with that individual. And there's a lot of reasons that people could have left coastal Campania, not necessarily associated with the, um, with the eruption. So I'm trying to be as conservative as possible. What I have found, however, is um, evidence at Cumi, Naples, Puteoli, and arguably Mycenaeum. But we're just going to focus on those first three, Cumi, um, Naples, and Puteoli. So let's take a look at the evidence from Cumi. Notably, these are all on the north side of the Bay of Naples. Nothing on the south or even as far south as Velia or Pestum provided any evidence for resettlement. Um, I was a little surprised by that, but um, um, that's, that's where this goes. These are the names that I found at Cumi. As you can tell, they're all Pompeian. Sorry about that. As, as Bob was kind enough to say, we'll, we'll, we'll allow it, um, some Pompeian material. Um, these are all names that I had found that were at Pompeii, obviously prior to the eruption, not found at Cumi prior to the eruption, but are found at Cumi um, starting about the turn of the century. So um, these are all names found in the last 20 years or the first 20 years of, um, of the second century at Cumi. Um, 
Eile, and I'll just run through a few of these. Um, some members of the Eileus Gens are found at Pompeii, and other members are um, found, of course, at Cumi. They all have the same prinomena, and that I think is important because the Eile are well spread, but their um, prinomena are not. Um, they are, in fact, regional or local. And so we can trace members of, um, of the family of the Eile, of one branch of it, um, through um, the, the prinomen Lucius. Um, and we find them at Pompeii in the Neronian and Flavian periods, and then at Cumi immediately afterwards. Also the Caecilii, again, um, using the prinomen um, Lucius, um, and Quintus here at Pompeii, notable for the, the, the Caecilius family there. And we find those, again, um, unusual prinomena not found anywhere else in Northern Campania at Cumi after um, the eruption, but never before. The, um, the suggested movement of the Caecilii is particularly interesting because along with the Caecilii, who seem to have been bankers at Pompeii, we have the Sulpicii at Pompeii. Members of the Sulpicii are known from their um, uh, financial records, which were discovered outside um, the walls of Pompeii. And, um, and these um, financial records, um, the tabulae here, um, mention some members of the family, um, as you see, Gaius Sulpicius Faustus and Gaius Sulpicius Venerus are listed on um, these tablets, 41, 90, and so on. What's particularly important about them is that these same individuals are found on a tomb inscription at Pompeii, late, uh, sorry, at Cumi later on. So we know that they were in Pompeii in life in the Whoa. later period of the community, and they appear at Cumi in death after um, the um, eruption. And so we see members of the Sulpicii, including two members who signed on, that, um, on those tablets. And so this is really, I think, some of my gold standard evidence, not just for descendants, but for actual individuals who are recorded at life in Pompeii and in death um, outside at Cumi after 79. What I think is particularly also a different form of evidence that helps is intermarriage. Families that were not intermarried or connected in Pompeii, so the Licinii and Lucretii at Pompeii, we don't have evidence that they um, were intermarried, but we do later at Cumi. These very common families at Pompeii who were there again in the later days of the community, the Neronian or Flavian period, appear at Cumi later on intermarrying, a, a standard pattern in refugee communities. Um, and um, I think additional evidence that we have um, a group of survivors that moved up the coast to Cumi. And there's the, a photo of, um, of um, one of the, um, the tomb inscriptions. And again, they're there in life at Pompeii and in death later on at Cumi. Um, what about supporting evidence? Well, this is actually, I think, um, very helpful because it's been a puzzle for a long time um, why there's so much Flavian construction at Cumi. And in fact, I was, um, uh, Fowler mentioned uh, Sandy McKay earlier, but as we were chatting before the lecture, and I was at CUME once with uh, Sandy McKay and Rufus Fierce, and we were arguing about this point. Why was there so much construction at CUME under Domitian? Um, was, did he have some unknown connection to the community? Um, was, you know, there's just all kinds of um, speculation and ab about why he would build here. And um, I think we know the answer now for the new community, for all these um, survivors. They expanded the amphitheater, built roads, public buildings, baths, uh, a branch of the aqueduct, all in the Flavian, all I think supportive of this new population. 
that made it um, to CUME after 79. Intriguingly, there's also um, a tomb inscription for a, um, uh, a member of uh, Domitian's uh, family or household rather, sorry, member of his household who died at CUME um, and was, um, was placed in a sarcophagus. Um, John Darms had pointed out that this, this phrase here, placed in a sarcophagus, indicates that this is somebody who was buried before sarcophagi became um, popular, um, when it was still a notable thing. And so he dates, dated this to actually, um, to the Flavian period, to the time of Domitian. Um, so there is an, interestingly, this um, um, financial official from the household down there at CUME who died there. Purely speculatively, he could have been there to, um, to um, well, um, coordinate the infrastructure. So we have a, one pattern at CUME, a number of survivors all from Pompeii resettle. Two of the families specifically are banking families um, from Pompeii, seeming to suggest that people are moving in personal networks. Um, they are moving where they have friends or where they have um, assets or, as I say, networks. Um, the pattern at Naples or Neapolis is slightly different. Neapolis, um, we find um, refugees or, sorry, um, survivors. I keep going back and forth on this term. Sorry about that. Um, I use refugee repeatedly, and then it was pointed out to me that these don't actually qualify as refugees under uh, the UN definition of refugees. So I'm trying to retrain myself to not say refugee, but I'm failing. Obviously, electroshock therapy is my next step, I promise. Okay, sorry about that. All right. If there's any UN officials here, I know I messed up. Okay. All right. We go on. Okay. Anyway, um, we have a, a number of nomina as well at, uh, at Naples. Um, but the pattern here is, is different because it's people both from Herculaneum and Pompeii who resettle at Naples. And you can see the list there of the, um, of the nomina. We'll just look at a few examples. Um, um, uh, the Caninius family, I think is particularly interesting because um, the Gens is at Herculaneum, but it's not in these other Northern um, Campanian communities. Uh, it's not a Puteoli, Cumi or Pompeii before um, before um, the eruption. And so it's really, um, it's not widespread um, in Campania, which allows me to say that these are certainly survivors. What also allows me to say that is I have another one of these gold standard individuals um, from Herculaneum. And this is um, um, Marcus Caninius Botrio, who appears on the album of Herculaneum, the, the listing of citizens um, that we believe was, um, was carved from a cent and, and put up um, after a census after the earthquake um, in 62. And he appears there on, um, on that. Um, so he's at Herculaneum in life. And then he appears um, at Neapolis on a tomb inscription, Marcus Caninius Botrio with his family. And this is interesting because um, this might suggest that people are actually um, fleeing as a family. Um, and that was always a, a big question is who got out? Is there some differential in terms of mortality or survival? Is it just rich guys who hand the keys of their houses to their slaves and Herculaneum and say, I'm going away, see you later? Uh, it turns out not to be the case. It seems that people are actually getting out who are not necessarily wealthy. Um, a lot of, um, a lot of um, a freedmen and a lot of a possibly families are moving together. Um, this is one of the few individuals who actually tells us that um, he lived in Naples. Cornelius Fuscus uh, was at the colony of Pompeii, then lived in Naples, and then um, he is, becomes a, a Praetorian prefect, um, and he dies in about 90 in Dacia. So he joins the army, dies in Dacia in 90. His, uh, his um, epitaph is set up there, and this is the inscription, ILS 91. 07, you can look it up. 
Um, so we have, again, an individual who tells us that he moved from the colony of Pompeii to settle in Naples. And that's another, I think, excellent um, example at the right time of these individuals. Uh, we have intermarriage at Naples as well. Um, families that, again, were not connected previously um, in their source community, but are in their refuge community. Um, this tomb um, inscription I like very much because it has the Oscan word have um, at the beginning of the, um, of the inscription here. Now that's interesting because um, the Oscan word have is, um, is fairly common at Pompeii um, because that was an Oscan community. It's not actually found at Naples anywhere else except on this tomb inscription with the names of individuals who we know um, are, are, were families at Pompeii um, who um, seem to have resettled, I conclude, resettled here at Naples and brought their culture with them are using this Oscan term, which again, not found at, at, at Naples prior to this. And so we have intermarriage and we also have an indication of people bringing their, their, their culture with them. We also have this really intriguing inscription, um, which is a, a later dedication. Um, and the dedication is a, to the statue that's on top of the base. And I don't really care about that because I guess I'm mean. Um, but what I care about is the description about the location for this. It is set up here, Regio Primaria Splendissima Herculaneum, the foremost, most resplendent region of the Herculaneans, suggesting that there is a neighborhood at Naples set up for people from Herculaneum. Okay, so we have evidence for Herculanean refugees, sorry, survivors, um, and um, a neighborhood suggesting that they're setting up uh, an entire quarter of the city uh, set aside for these individuals. There's also evidence of infrastructure. Now, I'm sure you all know Naples far better than I do, um, but in my limited study there, it is tough to excavate in Naples and not a lot is, is found because of the continual um, occupation, but we have this marvelous inscription um, from the uh, Emperor Titus, um, which dates to um, AD 80 and tells us um, that he's restoring buildings, the names of which do not survive because of the break here, um, but buildings that had collapsed because of movements, plural, uh, of the earth. Um, and we think these are the earthquakes that were associated with the eruption because the date of his titles here indicates that it's post-eruption. This I think is that rebuilding um, in these um, resettlement communities on the edges of, um, of um, the eruption itself. Uh, jo Barry um, actually mentions in her complete Pompeii book. There's other evidence I think for refugees at Naples itself. Um, the fact that um, the city is, um, is resurveyed, um, that the walls and um, the pomerium seem to be extended. And then there is the new construction. In addition to Titus's um, inscription there, um, there are other public buildings, a new theater, a new Odeon, and so on, are put in in the Flavian period. And this intriguing um, edict of Domitians against planting vines in favor of grain production, um, which um, um, seems to have been um, seems to have been designed to uh, to ensure that um, that um, a grain production, particularly it's argued in Campania, um, goes forward rather than um, rather than more wine, um, probably because of um, of the loss of farmland. Finally, um, Puteoli, also here in coastal Campania, um, gives us uh, another community where I'm I think we can say for certain that we have um, survivors. The, the profile here is the same as at Neapolis. It is a mix of survivors from both Pompeii and Herculaneum um, together. Um, we have the individuals, again, who don't appear here prior to 79, but their names suddenly do afterwards. 
Um, we have intermarriage between these individuals. Um, and we have an intriguing um, idea, um, both here at, well, there's actually a couple of examples. I just put one on here at Puteoli. And that is that we have individuals who seem to have um, moved from Herculaneum, like Gavius Donatus. And then we have members of the Gens at Puteoli after 80, like Gavia Donata. And then we have their offspring, Marcus Gavius Puteolanus, who seems to be the first generation born at Puteoli and is given the cognomen Puteolanus here. Um, and there's two of these individuals actually at Puteoli that are in the, what I conclude is the first generation um, of, um, of those born in the community from survivors. And so their family members make it out, they move here, they reestablish their lives, and then they name their sons the Puteolian, Puteolians, um, which I really think is just a, an intriguing notion that they actually are integrating into this community. Um, that, that perhaps um, these neighborhoods that are set aside for them are not slums somewhere, but they actually are integrating into the community. And we have two of those at Puteoli from this period. We also, of course, have the surviving, um, uh, the supporting evidence um, of infrastructure, much the same that we have at, um, at Neapolis, but actually very close to what we have at CUME. Another um, confusingly large Flavian amphitheater, um, as we have at CUME, um, we have at Puteoli. The question has always been, um, why suddenly these two communities need these large amphitheaters? Well, I think the answer here is um, they suddenly have more people. We have the new McCallum. We have roads, baths, harbor works, all the infrastructure you would expect of having a larger number of community members. And as um, at Naples, we have expansion of the territory of the city itself. Um, it suddenly um, becomes larger, okay? Well, so what? This is nice, um, not gonna change too much. Well, that's true. Um, nevertheless, I think, um, I think it's interesting. And I think it tells us a, a couple of things beyond just um, the fact that people got out and where they went. For example, we have this um, intriguing passage in Suetonius's Life of Titus, where he has talked about Titus, the Emperor Titus's response to um, the eruption. He designated the properties of those overwhelmed in the eruption of Vesuvius who left no surviving heirs for the restitution of the afflicted citizenry. Well, the question has always been, what does that mean? Because the communities at Pompeii and Herculaneum certainly were not um, restored. And what's going on? And I think the answer here is that this money from these estates of those people who left no heirs is used um, to, to not rebuild those previous communities, but to, um, to augment their new communities. I think this tells us where the money came from, or at least part of it, at um, CUME. Um, Naples and um, Puteoli. And so if we look at the list, I think we get a sense of the names that we can put actual names to these um, survivors for the first time. We can say where they came from. We can say where they settled. We can say in many cases, whether they had kids. In some cases, we think why they went where they did um, because they have friends or social or financial networks there. Um, we have interesting other um, connections. I haven't covered all the evidence because we'd be here forever. Um, but the Umbricii, the, the, the garum uh, makers from Pompeii, famous for their, their garum factories and shops at Pompeii, um, moved to Puteoli. And, um, and for, at Puteoli, after um, AD 80, we have the first evidence for a garum um, industry at Puteoli. Um, it seems intriguingly possible that the Imbrici move and set up shop once again. Um, the Imbrici are one of these families that in the first generation, they have an Imbricius 
Puteolanus. Um, they mentioned they name one of their sons the Puteolian, and um, and they're off um, doing what they had done before, reestablishing their lives. Um, if you're for those of you who are interested just in Herculaneum, I've digested out the evidence here for just the Herculaneum names or the names I can't discern. Certainly, I think these are Herculaneums here. Um, these are the names, the source. These are, as you can see, are all from the album. These are all from that um, list of Herculanean citizens after the earthquake. Um, and then where they go. The Herculaneans move north, they stay on the coast. And as far as I can tell, they stay in um, Puteoli and Neapolis. And then these are the inscriptions um, that, um, that show uh, that the evidence for, for where they moved. So I conclude that yes, we can find survivors of the eruption of Vesuvius, more from Pompeii than Herculaneum, that they move as families, that they are not resettled by the government. In other words, unlike a lot of modern patterns where people make it out, um, the government is not telling these people where to go after this disaster. They are resettling themselves. Um, I suspect that what we have is a pattern of people who either fled immediately when the eruption started or who were away from the cities when the eruption occurred. Of course, a lot of people at Herculaneum and Pompeii had business interests outside those cities. Many of them in the warehouse um, district at Puteoli, they may have been there outside the city itself. Um, intriguingly, um, there is some evidence that some people got out of Herculaneum um, if they left immediately after the eruption started. And I draw your attention to the famous example of the skeletons here in the, um, in the boathouses um, at, um, at Herculaneum. And of course, those boathouses which have no boats in them. I think it's entirely possible that the, the boats took a group out um, and that these are the people waiting for those boats to come back um, for them later on. Whether those boats all made it out finally or whether or not they got destroyed in the bay, of course, we, we don't know. Um, but I think the empty boathouses suggest that that first line of boats all went out. And the, the, the pattern of, um, of remains at Pompeii as well, I think is suggestive that people um, made it out also there. I think, as I said, that the decision where they resettled is personal, probably based on personal financial social networks like the Sulpici and the Caecilii um, at CUME. Um, and then as a result of um, following that, government responds um, to um, where they moved and um, rebuilds communities for them where they are. And that finally, Suetonius' line about restoring Campania refers to resettling of refugees and using the money to build this new infrastructure in those new communities. It's not about rescue in the old communities. It's about um, resettlement. So that's what I have. Um, and that's where I am. I'm going to leave that up there. And um, I would love to have any questions um, that you have about this. Um, and um, thank you very much. <laughs>